Hey guys, welcome to Urology Biology. On this episode, I have got a really nice Panerai Pam 009. Now this watch dates from 1998, which actually makes it a B-series pan, and it has got the ETA 6497-2 movement inside. It's a hand-wound movement, and I believe it actually was a pocket watch movement that these guys revamped. It's beautifully decorated, which you guys are going to see real soon anyway. Now this watch actually belongs to a really close friend of mine and I recently visited him in France and he told me prior to my visit that he was having some problems with this watch and basically that the dial spins and I thought huh first of all that's not fresh because dials should not spin on their own and I was just assuming that the winding stem had broken or the case clamps had come loose and the whole movement was just turning in the watch and that's actually not the case at all the watch fully winds you can set the time and it runs so I was a bit confused now logically I would just assume that the dial feet are broken, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to strip the watch completely down, going to clean everything, I'm going to rebuild it, and of course I need to address that dial issue and find out what's going on inside. So I've just removed the strap and the uh, crown guard from the watch as you can see, they're just held on with screws and they make it a lot easier, and to be honest I actually prefer the screw method for the lugs rather than the traditional type. Screw back case, and that simply just came off with a ball. I did have to loosen it first with my more heavy duty case removing tool. I should actually film that sometime so that you guys can see it. And inside you have got the 6497-2. And man, I really, really like how they've decorated this. And it's such a shame that it doesn't have an exhibition case back so that you can't actually see it because that is one seriously beautiful looking movement. I love the blued screws and they're just Panerai just written everywhere, completely over the top, but it just looks really, really nice. So let's get the movement out of the watch, and first obviously I'm just going to loosen off the setting lever screw, and then I can pop out the crown and the winding stem. Super oversized crown on these watches, but they are really big watches. They come in at 44 millimeter, which is pretty beefy on your wrist. So the movement's held in with two movement screws, just like any other movement, and obviously I need to remove those and then remove the case clamps as well, and then I can pop out the movement. And then of course we're going to see exactly how much this dial is spinning in regards to what my friend was talking about. So now that everything's loose, obviously I can just flip it over and then I can remove the case. And I must admit, I really love the aging on this case. Even though it's not that old, it's aged so well. So I think it's safe to say that when we're looking at this and the way that the hands are in place and the movement is not moving, but the dial is, somewhere along the line, for whatever reason, these dial feet have broken, which is a little bit strange. So just removing the hands, no seconds hands on this whatsoever. You've literally just got an hour and a minute. Now they actually did two different dial variants with this. You had the tritium dial and you also had the luminova dial. And this is a luminova dial. And from what I read and from my understanding, the tritium ones are actually worth quite a bit more money. And of course they are more rare. But guys, look how thick this dial is. It's like a dinner plate, man. That's going to be like about five mil thick. And there we see it. Dial feet completely broken, completely sheared out. And the question is, why? Spoke to my friend about it and he said it's actually the second time that it's happened to him and he had it repaired in France, which cost him quite a lot of money, had it serviced at the time and they fixed the issue. The weird thing is, what I don't understand is, I don't see any kind of repair going on in regards to these dial feet. They look just literally snapped off. But I don't see any kind of re-gluing or soldering or epoxying or anything like that. So I'm actually wondering if they actually replace the dial. So I've took off the cannon pinion and now I've flipped the movement over so now I can address the other side. And I have to say again guys, I really really like how this movement looks. Just the attention to detail is so nice. So taking off the complete balance and then I will obviously put that to one side because we will obviously need that later on for when it's going to be cleaned. Safest place to keep a balance is back on the movement. And I always turn these back upside down as well. It's just basically to relieve any kind of stress on the balance staff. I don't want all that weight just sitting on there for the whole duration of me stripping this watch down. 
So I find it always better just to leave it upside down. Personal preference. And even the screws for the ballad bridge are blued as well, which is really nice. But it's funny as well because technically, I don't think I've ever worked on a pocket watch movement before. Uh, I never learned like that. Now, I know a lot of people and things that I've read, they always say, oh, when you get into watchmaking, start with a pocket watch because it's so much bigger, it's easier to work on. And if I'm honest, I didn't want to do that. No, I wanted to work on the real thing straight away. Impatient, that's what I wanted. So this is actually the largest uh, movement that I've worked on. And I have to say, it is kind of enjoyable that everything is so much bigger. Uh, but the only strange thing that I found about it was I'm using screwdrivers in my screwdriver set that I've never used before. So just removing the click, and I'm really trying to be careful with these screws as well. And like I said, it's important that you use the right size head for it as well, because I don't want to scratch them. They have some marks on them, obviously, from previous servicing, but I try my best not to add to that as well, because they really do add the character to this movement. And again, I'm just really surprised that it doesn't have an exhibition case back. I know some Panerais do, but it also would be really nice if this one did, because guys, I mean, look at it, man. It just looks so nice, this movement. So off goes the ratchet wheel, and then I can tackle the crown wheel as well. Now it is a reverse threaded screw on this, so obviously you need to turn it the opposite way to unscrew it. Sometimes with the crown wheels, you get a crown wheel and a crown wheel core. This is a complete piece, so there's actually no core to it. There is a little washer on the inside, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to refer to that as a core because yeah, it's too small. It, it is just a washer. So now I can take off the train of wheels bridge, held in with just those two screws. But I know you guys will see it later on as well, but the case, it's a PVD case, so a black case, but the way that this is aged, even though technically this watch is not that old, I mean, 1998, it's, yeah, it's a good few years, but it's not like it's from the 60s or anything. But I really love how it's turned this black into this almost like gunbolt metal kind of color. And it just looks awesome. Really, really super fresh looking case. So just inspecting the wheels, and then I can also take them all out and put them to one side. There's the escape wheel, and now I can tackle the um, barrel bridge. And it's absolutely huge, as you can see. Held in with three screws, and it has some weight to it. I mean, this is a serious chunk of metal, guys. So just taking my time with this, pry it with a screwdriver in the correct places, and then obviously you can just take it aside. And then of course, just removing the last two wheels, and then we've got the barrel bridge, sorry, the uh, mainspring barrel with the mainspring inside. Now I'm not actually gonna open this barrel, and the reason being is, is that it's not that long ago that my friend actually had this serviced. The main reason with this watch, obviously, is because of the dial issue. So I decided basically, because the watch was not running particularly bad at all, I decided not to uh, change the mainspring on this. And as you can see, the dial feet are actually still there. And this is a good indication for me because now I'm gonna try and reuse these and not actually use different dial feet. I mean, you need to stick them on somehow anyway. So I thought, well, if I have the original ones, and I can just sand them down a little bit and make these fit, then that'll be a good solution to use the original parts. So movement flipped over, and now I can take off the setting lever spring. And underneath you've got the minute wheel, and then the, there are two small intermediate wheels. Now if you do find that these give you trouble, just use a little piece of Rodico. It's so much easier than using tweezers sometimes, especially if it's a small, item that's on a post and it's got a little bit of oil underneath it, you're going to be fighting a losing battle trying to get it with your tweezers. So Rodico, it really helps. It's got a million and one different uses for that stuff. So I see that the winding pinion and the sliding pinion just popped out. 
I can take off the yoke, also the yoke spring. Always hold it down with some pegwood because you don't want these springs to fly across the room. And uh, yeah, the last thing you want to be is on your hands and knees looking for something which is millimeters in size. That's not fresh, no sir. So a quick pegging of these jewels on this main plate before it obviously goes into the cleaning machine. And then I can pop the balance back on. As I said, always the best place to put this, guys. I've said it in my other videos. And if you are working on a watch and you're not exactly sure where to put your balance, simply just put it back onto your main plate. It is the safest place. It's where it lives anyway. And when it's going to be banging around in a cleaning machine, you want it to be secure because the hairspring is, of course, super delicate. And try and find me somebody who likes hairspring work. No, sir. It's not fresh. So picking out the other jewels as well on the other two plates. And now I'm also just giving a little bit of clean into this case. Again, I really like how that case looks. It's so nice, man. So we can start on the rebuild of this watch now. Everything's clean. It's all come out of the cleaning machine. And now I'm basically going to oil the capstones. So what I do is the bottom of the underside I will put into some one dip just to give it a little clean. And then I will basically remove the oil, the dried oil from the capstone. And then also I give it some fixer drop treatment. And the reason why we use the fixer drop is obviously is we don't want the oil to run around going everywhere when we re-oil it. It's such a small area. It's all about control. And the fixer drop will provide you with that control. So a little bit of 90-10, you only need to cover around 70% of the circumference of this capstone and that's more than enough. And then you simply press it on. And because now obviously I've got these super high close-up shots, you can actually see. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that perfect little circle of oil in the middle of the capstone. And that of course is going to sit right exactly where the balance stuff is going to pop through the middle. And it's just going to sit suspended in that beautiful little drop of oil, all running in harmony, all perfect, all fresh. Mm, that's exactly how you want it. So just close up the shock system. And then once you've done this, you will simply just completely repeat the whole process on the opposite side. Because you've got one on each side, remember. I always like to just clean off any excess with some Rodico as well. Again, same treatment, some 90-10, and then back onto the watch. And there we have it. That's another great example, as you can see. You're looking for that perfect little circle in the middle. And it's just definitely going to help the watch run as it should do. And of course, as it was intended to. So once you've put it back onto the movement, simply just close the shock system again. And then once you've done this, then of course you don't need the balance anymore. So you need to remove it. Some people do this prior, or they remove the capstones prior to washing, but if I'm honest, I prefer just doing it afterwards. So of course now we can get on to finishing building up the watch. So I'm basically just doing a little bit of oil in now. A little bit of 1300 for where the setting lever screw is going to go. Also add a little bit of 1300 to where the arbor is going to sit from the barrel. And as you can see as well here, I've just attached the uh, setting lever on to the back of the setting lever screw. It's easier to do it at this stage, I find. I always prefer to do it at the beginning of a rebuild than doing it later. Also a little bit of 1300 where the center wheel is going to go as well. And then we can just simply pop in the barrel. 
Again, a little 1300 where the barrel bridge is going to live, connecting and touching on the arbor. It's a moving part, so you do need to have a little bit of lubrication. And then I can build up the train of wheels. So guys, if you're watching this video and you like it, feel free to hit a like, of course. And the other thing I was going to say is, feel free to subscribe to the channel. I am actually running a continuously long Omega giveaway promotion, where when I hit 10,000 subscribers, I am giving away a complete serviced Omega Seamaster bumper watch from 1952, serviced by yours truly, and I'm going to be giving that away to basically one of the subscribers of the channel. As soon as we hit 10,000, boom, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm looking forward to that. So once you've got your wheels in place, then you want to basically carefully put your bridge back on. And again with this, I've always stressed on this, take your time. Eye it up, take your time, make sure that all your pivots are being aligned. These are very, very small, thin pieces of metal. They will break very easily. And another thing with this, why I'm taking extra care is because these bridges are so heavy. They're a lot bigger than a watch, let's say, a normal watch size. This is a very, very big movement. And I'm not sure if you're actually grasping this by the video, because I'm not sure if I'm giving much reference points visually, so to speak. But it is a very big movement. Like I said, once everything is engaged, give it a test. You're wanting to make sure that everything is running super freely, no stress. And then, of course, you can basically screw everything down. I like to take my time when screwing things down. Screw and then check, screw and then check. So I'm adding now 1300 for where the crown wheel is going to go. Also for where the ratchet wheel as well. And, of course, the click. I always like to do my oiling in like little stages. Some people like to do it individually, but if I'm working on a particular section of a movement, like the motion works or the keyless works, I will just do it all in one go and then bam, 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 just put all the parts on. I just find it quicker. I think it's more efficient and it's just the way I prefer to do it. So again, don't forget reverse threaded screw. So you're going to tighten it the opposite way of what you usually would. Now I can put in this uh, strange looking little click spring. Also popping in the ratchet wheel as well. And then I can pop in the click and of course screw everything down. Just like to say as well thanks to the guys that uh, tuned into my uh, semi road trip live stream that I did last week. I appreciate that, guys. Thanks. must admit, it is really nice to uh, read some of the comments and actually liaise with some of you guys in a live situation. Even though sometimes, obviously, well, I mean, I suppose it is. It feels like I'm just talking to myself, but obviously I'm reading your messages as it's live, and I think that's really cool. But on the way back from France, oh, man, I got hit hard, man. It was supposed to be like a five-and-a-half-hour drive, but it turned into like just over a seven-hour drive. Literally, as soon as I hit the Netherlands, I hit like a traffic accident. So there was like an over an hour tailback. Oh, it was crazy. And then the worst thing is, and I've never understood why people do this. So everybody's crawling in the traffic because it's just so slow. Then when you finally get to the point where you're passing the accident, where they're cleaning it up and, you know, removing people from the road, so to speak, and then people slow down even more while they're taking videos of this. Man, it's disgusting, man. Like, why would you even do this? It's not normal. It's not fresh. And it's not how it should be done. But people do this. And I just think, is this the world we're living in now? That the minute something negative or bad happens, you have to whip out your camera phone and get this up on Facebook or whatever? Oh, man. It's, it's, I find it sickening, guys. I don't know what you think, but I, I find that kind of stuff really sickening. So continuing building up the watch, and obviously now I'm just going to oil the jewels. So I use a combination of 1300 and also 9010. And what you're seeing now is I'm adding just a little bit of grease. I know it looks like I have a lot on the end of the oiler. I do, but it doesn't mean that I basically just throw it all on. You can see that I just dab it lightly. And this is where the cannon pinion is going to go. 
Now, can opinions friction fit? And this is also quite a big one, with it being obviously a bigger movement. It has no hole at the top because there is no seconds hand, obviously. Uh, it's purely just for hour and minute. So continue with the oil in, adding some 1300 onto these fixed posts where the intermediate wheels and the minute wheel are going to go. By the way, always add your cannon pinion on first as well when you're working on this side of the watch. And the reason being is if you put your minute wheel on and your intermediate wheels and then you're slamming down your uh, cannon pinion, it's friction fit, so the last part of it is quite a forceful thud. And if you're not careful, you could potentially damage teeth on your minute wheel. And uh, then you're going to be in a whole heap of trouble. So always do your cannon pinion first. So starting on with the keyless works, and I'm just added some grease to the winding pinion. And now I'm going to put in the sliding pinion. I also add a tiny little bit of grease as well on the top of it for where the yoke's going to engage with it. Just a tiny little dot. And then I can pop on the yoke. Which will be followed by the yoke spring of course as well. A little bit of grease as well where it's going to engage with the uh, setting lever. And now carefully aligning the yoke spring, making sure it's all engaged properly. And that's why it's important to use pegwood so that you can keep it secure. It's kind of like a second hand. And now I can put in this massive, massive setting lever spring. Man, this thing is huge. It's so big, but yet it's still only held in with one screw. So I screw it in, not all the way, just partially because I want to make sure that I engage it all first. And the reason I do it partially is so that if something flies, it's not going to fly away because obviously there's a decent amount of thread holding this thing down. And just clicking that in place. And of course, because now it's all engaged, now I can continue to screw it down and it's all finished. So you just want to check that everything's engaging, check that the wheels are all running together. Check, of course, that you can pull out the crown. And then, of course, clean off any excess grease that you've made. Most of the time, there always will be some excess. And that's not a problem, just as long as you clean it afterwards. So the movement completely turned back over now, and now we can put the pallets in. So I use fixer drop on the pallets as well because I need to oil the exit stone and then I use a little bit of wood so that I can just remove any of the fixer drop residue off of the pivots. And I do that because I don't want to basically add unnecessary friction and the fixer drop can basically create some friction. So once that's engaged now I can put in the pallet bridge. I must admit this movement was quite easy to work on with it being so big. So I completely understand the whole methodology behind, you know, working on pocket watches first if you're not used to working on watches. Because yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's huge, man. <laughs> it's like seriously big. So I give it a few winds because I want to make sure that A, it engages and B, I need to oil the exit stone, which I will do three times and then basically maneuver it five times and you're doing that so that you're getting a little bit of oil onto each of the escape wheel teeth so you simply just move it five times and then you repeat the process now the other thing that i do as well is once i've done all of that i will actually remove all of the wind now from the watch is what i'm doing by holding the click back and then i will remove the pallet bridge and the pallet forks. I will clean the pallet forks because I want to get any oil off of there and then I will basically put them back on. On any fixer drop I don't need it anymore. Again it's about minimizing friction and keeping things as clean as you possibly can. So once that's done it's been given a good wind and I can put on the complete balance with the balance cock. 
And of course, it fires up really nice, which is really good to see. So I'm very, very happy about that. Held in with the one screw. And again, just carefully nipping this up because I don't want to scratch these screws because they are seriously beautiful. So now we move on in regards to this dial thing. So what I decided to do was I decided to basically just like sand off a little bit of this to create more of a rougher edge. I did the same on the back of the dial as well. And I bought basically the hardest like epoxy for metal work that I could find, which is a two ply. So you mix two together and then you let it cure. I let it cure for over a day and then they were very hard the dial feet. I just thought because I have the original dial feet it would be silly to use new dial feet if you have the original ones. Now if this isn't going to hold up obviously in the future then obviously I will basically change it and do a different option by using a different dial replacement feet. But for now this seems to be working really well. And this stuff that I bought is damn strong. I mean, it was ridiculous what it said on the box, that it holds up to something like 20 kilos in weight or something. And I thought, well, that's a little bit more than what I need. But I was like, no, I'll get some of this. But the cure time for it was just the frustrating part because I can be a bit of an impatient person. And when you just want to complete something, then I'm like, okay, I need 24 to 28 hours for this to cure intensely. I thought, oh man, it's like so long. Why can't I be one of those like 10 minute dry things? But of course, we're not using super glue, we're using industrial stuff. So like I said, I prepped everything and then I basically applied with a I've, with toothpicks. I used toothpicks to apply the, the epoxy and then I fit the dial feed on there. Lining them up as best as I can. The good thing is I have the holes as reference or the where they snapped off as reference, so I know exactly where they need to be. But I just want to make sure that I have a decent amount of epoxy to hold this moving forward. So a little bit of 1300 for where the hour wheel is going to go. Just putting that on the side of the cannon pinion. And I can pop on the hour wheel and then I can put the dial washer on as well. And then of course I can fit this big ass dial. Seriously, they are so thick and I'm just wondering if that is the reason why this broke. I'm wondering if this is a common issue, I don't know, but like I said, for some reason it seems to have happened to my friend twice now, so it's a little bit strange. I'd say that these are probably about five millimeter like thickness, four or five millimeter thick, and if you compare those to like a standard watch, the thickness of the dial, it's definitely what, like three or four times thicker? Crazy. So they're obviously getting tightened up these dial feet on the other side. You simply just have to turn the screw like 180 and it'll lock it in place. Now I can tackle the hands. Super easy, of course. There's no seconds hand, there's no date. So I can just put the 12 hour hand on wherever I want. And I'm just gonna push that down in place with a hand press tool. So obviously just make sure that it doesn't in, engage with anything it shouldn't do, obviously, like basically being too close to the dial, etc. Then obviously I will set the time to 12 o'clock so I can put on the minute hand. And this is a really, really nice looking dial. It has a really nice matte kind of finish to it, or a satin kind of look, I would say, actually. Maybe not, it's not desperately matte, more of a satin kind of finish. Just checking sure that the hands are engaging correctly, which they are. Cleaning off any dust, just rolling over with some Rodico. And now I can case up with this awesome looking case. Ah oh man, I've gone on about it enough already, but I really love how this case is aged. Now it's not just all jet black. It's just looking like, honestly, like, like a tank, like gun bolt metal. It looks awesome. So got getting the movement in the case and what I'm doing now is this three gaskets that I'm putting onto this. So there's one that goes into the crown tube. There's one that goes around the, uh, the bottom of the winding stem into the crown, as you can see. 
And then of course, there's the main big case back gasket as well, which will go on as well. And I've greased all of these up with some silicone. It makes them a lot more supple and it also makes them a lot easier to fit as well. So in goes the crown and the winding stem and I'm just going to tighten that up. And now I can just basically put on the gasket for the case back. Just in adding on the, uh, the case clamp uh, tabs, and then I can just screw those down, one on each side. And of course, just closing up the case. Just nipping it up with the ball for now. It's more than enough at this moment. And the other thing that I decided to do as well with this was obviously to treat this watch to a new strap. So that is exactly what I did as well. Before I get to that, I obviously just need to fit this crown guard back on. Again, like I said, held on with two screws. Very easy. So I decided to get a brand new strap for this. It's an aftermarket one, but the other one that was on it was also aftermarket as well. But it does have the original Panerai buckle. All fits perfectly and works great. So checking it out on the timographer. Now, when I first tried this and everything, I put it on, it was set to 52 degree lift angle, which I believe is actually wrong for this watch. So I checked out to find out the correct reading for this and it's actually got a lift angle of 44 degrees, which is a hell of a big difference to 52. And you can actually see that it runs really well, but there is a very big difference in amplitude between uh, 52 and 44, which is obviously logical, but I'm still more than happy with the results that it's providing at a lift angle of 44 degrees. Coming in around the 270s, and obviously I will regulate this. To be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if this jumps up. I've seen this with watches many times before where they jump up in amplitude once the oils have settled. And this really is a beautiful looking watch, guys. Seriously, awesome looking case. Cannot complain about it in any shape or form whatsoever. I'm really liking the dark brown strap on it. It looks so much nicer than the black one. I think it just adds so much difference of contrast. And again, this is seriously a fresh looking watch. So if you want your chance to win a 1952 Omega Seamaster bumper, all you need to do is subscribe to the channel. And if you want to see this watch, there it is on the screen right now. Just click it and enjoy.